Mike Fisher here from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. Um, I have sat on the outside of this room for a great deal of the testimony you've heard on this bill and um, have spent a good deal of time in the last couple of weeks thinking about the challenge in front of you with this bill. And um, it is a little bit of a flashback of um, challenges I've seen at this table for many years. Um, it strikes me that uh, uh, one of the one of the challenges for me in my role as the as the healthcare advocate is that I sit sort of at times uncomfortably between two significant approaches uh, about what do we do with our healthcare system. Um, there is a part of me and a part of my office that. Uh, that comes from and holds an activist view of our system's broken and needs broad reform. But when somebody calls our office and says, I um, don't understand why I have such a big copay for something, or isn't it unfair that, um, uh, just to use examples that have come before this table, uh, that uh, uh, I keep getting these copays for. Uh, my uh, breast imaging. Um, I thought that was supposed to be covered. Um, the answer, our system is broken, needs to be reformed, is not sufficient. Um, we also need to live in the much more wonky, uh, healthcare wonky world of um, uh, what adjustments do we need to make um, in the meantime. Um, it feels to me like there's a real analogy here. I think the various uh, versions of this bill um, fall on those, it, it generally in those camps. And um, I, I regularly have to, in my role, regularly have to push back on members of my staff um, who say, we need to live in one camp. Um, um, we need to, um, so, I, so, so I find myself, as I come to this table, with that very same thought, that I, I don't find the, um, while I agree with the approach that um, the system is broken and needs very deep reform uh, and, and, and should be publicly financed, um, given the political landscape, um, I don't find it sufficient. I also don't find it sufficient. You've heard a parade of people who have come before you, and um, it strikes me that I'm, I had the thought as I was sitting down today that I was going to step on everyone's toes. Um, um, so let me step on the other toes now. But they're all available for seven. <laughs> yeah. I, I also, I, you've heard a parade of people who have said, uh, they're going to tell me this is unfair, but some version of, we're on the job. We're making it work. We have a lot on our plates. Um, um, don't pile more on our plates. I, I don't find that argument sufficient either. Um, uh, you, you know, I, I know and love and support our FQHCs, and they provide a very important role in uh, giving people access to care. And um, yesterday you heard some about the sliding scale that's available uh, to people. Uh, just as a reminder, the sliding scale is up to 200% of the federal poverty level. So a family, so an individual above $224,000 some income is above the sliding scale for the FQHCs. Um, when I look at uh, the flow of cases that come to my office, and when I search for um, in my database, uh, you know, just as a reminder, we get about 4,000 calls uh, cases a year. Though our numbers are a bit up right now, by the way, as I'm working on my quarterly report, um, <clears throat> and I search for access to care, uh, primary care. Um, I see a whole set of people who are having challenges getting the care they need. Um, and some of them show up as, um, uh, I couldn't afford the premium, so I don't have insurance, and now I need primary care. 
and um, some of them show up. Um, and, and then there's a whole range of other possibilities as to why uh, someone came, called our office and asked for help. Um, and then I, I always need to say, um, again, I searched for 2017 for access to care, primary care, in my database, and I got 36 hits. Um, I have no idea how to measure the relationship of the, uh, of the world, the universe of Vermonters who had that had such issues. Um, what percent of them knew to call the healthcare advocates office, and what percent of them did? Use your own judgment. I think all I can report back to you is um, today on the ground, Vermonters do have access to care challenges in accessing primary care. Um, <clears throat> What is on the landscape for um, access in the coming years? Um, I don't know how to answer that question. I think there are substantial threats. Um, I think Alan Ramsey uh, did a pretty good job of, of uh, I agree with the predictions he made uh, about threats to access. Um, threats to our insurance marketplace. And um, um, so, um, and, then, and then in my uh, many thoughts that came to me as I listened to the various to testimony, um, I also think it's really important to remind ourselves the, uh, the accountable care organization is a, uh, or approach, the accountable care approach um, seeks to change the relationship between payers and providers and change provider practices uh, through adjustments there. Um, and I've, you've probably heard me say these very words before, but I, I need to keep saying them. Um, I don't care what kind of new fancy relationships that are achieved there and how much they change behaviors of providers if people can't afford the access in the first place. Um, so, uh, so ultimately, my message to the committee is, um, yes, there's a lot of uh, interesting, hopeful things going on. Yes, we've built a great FQH uh, clinic um, uh, 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 presence around our communities. Um, um, and yes, there are, is some hopefulness in our approach with um, payment reform with, with um, sorry, with delivery reform through the ACO model. Um, but I don't find it sufficient. Um, and I don't know why, ultimately, it has to be one version or the other. I think there's an argument for um, uh, continuing to move the ball, keep the ball on the field, continuing to focus on the, the viability and appropriateness of publicly financing health care while addressing uh, and, and measuring the challenges we have in this case in accessing primary care. Um, again, I said I, I think I, it was 36 people called my office. How deep is the problem of accessing primary care? Are there questions there that um, a study committee could uh, could evaluate and, uh, and give feedback to committees like this about action steps that could be taken um, separate from uh, public financing, um, or maybe before public financing, ideally? Um, what is the out-of-pocket exposure uh, uh, and how does it limit access? Um, are there areas of the state where, uh, uh, where there are just not openings, where there is insufficient uh, number of providers? Um, and, and many other questions I'm sure I can't even think of right now. So um, for what it's worth, those are the thoughts uh, that come to me as I uh, come to sit at this table on the, on, uh, on this bill. 
I, I appreciate that, um, the way that you sort of flushed out all the different angles. Um, what would, what's unclear to me is what you think we should do. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, if you were on this committee, what would you do at this point? So, so very much, I, I, I find myself wondering if there's a, uh, a meshing of the two versions of the bill available. And, and it, it, it might be that it's very hard to achieve that. But um, uh, that's sort of generally what I'm saying to you, um, that it's, uh, I hope it's not an either or. Um, I ask this also knowing your previous experience. So, mm -hmm. um, do you think there's any value to starting to save up money to finance future changes? Because we received some uh, letters and suggestions that we incorporate some elements into our bill around that. I don't know if you review everything we look at, but um, do you think there's any benefit to? saving up money without a clear plan of what it's going to be used for? I think it would be very, uh, I don't know about value. I think it would be very hard to do so. Okay. Um, I think, um, I think it would be very hard to do so. <laughs> I mean, let me leave it there. There are pressing needs uh, today on the budget that uh, the likes of me would come and say this needs to be spent on some on need we have right now. Any questions? I, I, I maybe will just say one more thought that's on, been on my mind for a long time, and that is um, one of the main reasons why I have always been a supporter of public financing um, is because, um, I wish Representative Donahue was here for this example, um, was because um, I don't believe we will ever really truly commit the resources to um, public health care. Um, um, not population health care, but public, um, until we're responsible for it. And so, uh, you know, the example I always give is, um, I, think, I think we say something like 6.7% of the population in this country has uh, depression. And um, do we bring in each of those individuals to try and treat them? Yes, of course we do. Um, but. Um, what's it going to take for us to attempt to do a different approach that says something more like, wow, our community is sick with depression. We need to reach out and treat our community in a different way to treat <coughs> depression, for instance. And um, that's a very different approach than I think the term that's been said at this table uh, a lot lately, uh, population health, um, which is about uh, the population in your plan, in the plan, and how to reach out to them in a different way. Um, that's all good too, but um, it, uh, I, I can't miss the opportunity to say, um, you know, had we done Act 48, was it 48? 48? Mm -hmm and been living under a single finance, single payer financing system, um, we would be debating at this table the actions that the state has to take to limit the cost. The state would, in fact, be an insurance company and would be saying no to people, and people would be upset with that. Um, so it's not a, you know, the concept of public financing doesn't fix it all. It still costs too darn much. Um, but, um, but it is my hope that it is moving in that direction that frees us to some different thinking about where to make investments. Thank you. Thank you. Don't pull it up yet. Okay. Right. Lauren. <laughs> Lauren. Well, no, you can leave it up. Just don't pull their note up. 
schedule ahead some of the folks that I would hope I hope might be available for us this morning. And one of the things I did not do was to uh, ask for the Green Mountain Care Board to be here to review the, the note which they provided to us. Uh, but uh, I have asked Nolan, who has reviewed uh, the plan as it's, the S-53 as it's coming out of the Senate, as well as had reviewed S-53 as it was in the Senate Health and Welfare Committee. And what I'm wanting to ask Nolan, if you would walk us through some analysis that looks at the various different aspects of uh, the different versions of S-53, and then, uh, depending if that makes sense, then possibly to look at, uh, if it hasn't been incorporated, to look at the latest uh, information from the Green Mountain Care Board as well, in terms of the dollar impacts. Okay. If you could help us with that, that'd be great. Yep. Uh, for the record, Nolan Langwell, the Joint Fiscal Office, and I have incorporated the latest Green Mountain Care Board, actually both of their estimates, one for the as passed the Senate and as passed Senate Healthware. Senate Health and Welfare are both in, in incorporated in my fiscal notes, so I can talk to what they said. I won't get into the why. Yeah. <laughs> they, can, they, um, they can have an opportunity still to speak for themselves about that. So, I, and I won't get into too much detail because you've already had the walk through the bill. But as you know, the as passed the Senate was um, directed the Green Mountain Care Board to convene a group of stakeholders um, to get into to do the planning and whatnot. I'm not going to go into detail of that. Um, I'm going to highlight a few things. First off, in the second paragraph of my fiscal note, so the bill includes intent language saying that it is the intent of the General Assembly to provide sufficient resources. So the Green Mountain Care Board in fiscal years 2019 and 2020 to enable the board to carry out the duties set forth in this legislation. But the bill did not include the appropriation. There's two reasons why this language is in there. One was it passed the Senate at the time when that big bill was in the House. Right, the budget bill. And the second piece is that the Green Mountain Care Board did not provide, had not provided an estimate of what, uh, let me reframe it, the Senate, as you know, that passed the Senate Health and Welfare, went to Senate Appropriations, and they changed stuff, and then it passed. So the Green Mountain Care Board, I think, was probably caught a little off guard, and so they had not had the opportunity, I shouldn't say they did not, yeah. to weigh in on what they thought the costs would be. So at the time, there was no appropriations for those two reasons. Okay. So now we have it, um, or sorry, you have it, I we. Um, <coughs> And so they had provided a document, and I can go back and forth between their document and mine, but essentially their document they put out said it was going to be about 590000 to 770000 um, And I, I break it out in here. You can see that uh, contract costs are a piece of it, and then their FTE costs. And they arrange it because between ninety and 880000 Can you still all raise it higher? Um, Just but I think, I think your reference is to S-53, not S-175, is that correct? Yeah, it's a typo. <laughs> <laughs> I was writing... Am I missing something here? I don't know how Jen does it, but I was writing, madly writing fiscal notes for different legislation at the same time. And that's a skill that Jen clearly has, because she writes way more legislation to be able to say this is that. Um, thank you, I will. So. I will oh, sorry. beat I myself up over that over. later. We're talking S-53. The only thing I'm more surprised at is the fact that uh, Representative Donahue didn't catch it first. And it's only because she wasn't here. Because right. <laughs> she's got eagle eyes. <laughs> well, I'll give credit to Brian for catching that we're not in Manchester, Vermont, as well, in another letter that yeah. we got. Oh, I was going to say, did I have that in there, too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a letter that was, so for people who aren't, weren't, weren't in the room, we uh, received a letter that was directed to me as the chair, and it addressed it to me at the state capitol in Manchester, Vermont. <laughs> and, uh, so I hadn't noticed when hey, I where are we? Letter, but that, that's been correct, subsequently mm -hmm. corrected. Thank you for the correction. I will yeah. uh, fix that. <laughs> um, so the, the, the costs from the Green Mountain Care Board are broken into two pieces. One is estimated contract costs, 
and estimated FTE costs. Um, you know, and it's over a two-year period. And so you can see the contract costs change, but the FTE costs are ongoing. And there's two, there's a range because they weren't sure if they'd have to hire one or two people. So those are the cost of people. That includes wages and benefits and all the costs that go in with hiring somebody, I'm assuming. Okay, so can I just make sure I do understand which we're talking about here in terms of the estimates? We're talking about S53 as past. The Senate. The Senate. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so what then I, what I did was I added up the column and I got the gross. And so the gross range is uh, for, for 19 is between 425 and 515. For 2020, it's between 165 and 225. The total over the two years is 590 to 770. So I broke it out. They didn't really have it broken out. I broke it out so you can see that if we were to pass this as past the Senate, um, the state total you would need between 170,000 to 206,000 for fiscal year 19, and then 66 to 102,000 because of bill back. Okay, so explain that so that people make sure. So we have the gross cost, and then um, the Greenmont Care Board um, went back and they determined that these particular expenses do fit within their definitions of how they can utilize their bill back. So that they would, that the state cost would be less. Now, of course, as we, you've all had been well versed on bill back, when we bill back, we push those costs onto the um, industry. Okay. But, Maybe this is a question for the Green Mountain Care Board, and obviously I don't understand bill back as much as I should, but I thought the whole discussion we had this session was saying, bill back, we're going to do a better job of making sure that we're billing back specifically the time that it takes to regulate the agencies. And that's my question about this. It doesn't seem like it fits that structure that we're building. I think it fits well. I, I, I will defer to the Green Mountain Care Board, right. but there's two pieces to that. There's the the direct building and then the other piece, which I forget. I don't have the piece. There's a piece for like direct services right. and then the rest of which they sort of split up between the industry. So I'm assuming that this fits within that second piece. Jen's shaking her head yes. Good question. The revised bill back easier. Yes. Um, and then this piece just sort of talks about those pieces. Um, and to whom to whom are we billing back in this instance? That's what I'm trying to sort out. I'm going to call a friend here. <laughs> Jennifer Carty, Legislative Council, for the record. Um, so the uh, the way the new bill back language is making its way through the process is set up is it has certain expenses, um, direct regulatory expenses being billed directly to the regulated entity, and then for other ex all other expenses of the board go through the bill back. Formula, which is 40% from state money, 60% from the industry, broken out by hospitals, insurance companies, and the ACOs. So, is that second category like what funds um, healthcare advocate? And no, no there's a separate bill That's back. A separate, yeah, yeah, there's a separate, separate bill back bill. provision in um, healthcare advocates <coughs> statute. The difference with the current, the existing bill back is that it says for certain regulatory expenses. Uh, for rate review and for hospital budget review, those expenses get billed back in the according to the formula in statute. What the new language says is expenses that are directly related to regulating a particular um, company, really a particular entity, get billed back to that entity. All other expenses of the board are borne by the bill back formula, which is 40% state, 60% industry. And then it's it split up as prescribed in the right, so according to the between formula. insurance and hospitals. Right, and then with the additional 100, and then there's a, also a provision in the new one that has a minimum $150 um, uh, payment from any regulated industry. And if, they, if what it costs to regulate that particular company was not $150, then whatever the difference was goes to reduce the amount that gets billed back for other board expenses under the formula for the non-state actors. Glad I could clear that up. <laughs> and then the other thing I add in here is that it, in the end of this paragraph, I said one to two limited service positions would also need to be created if you were to take the recommendation of how the Green Mountain Care Board assumes that they would need the resources. So, and that's generally, we do that in legislation as well when you have to create new positions. Thank you. 
So I'm just going to raise the question, and we, we will need you from the Green Knight Care Board on this and not put you in a mm -hmm. position, but having, having had the explanation about Build Back, I'm still somehow a little bit perplexed as to why the legislature directing the Green Mountain Care Board to look at the issue of universal primary care. I guess I need to understand how that fits into the justification for bill back to hospitals to right. carriers, et cetera. Why that isn't why is why is the state not bearing the full cost? Why is the state not bearing the full cost? And that the state should be, if this, if this is a study that the state, meaning us, is setting in motion and requiring of the Green Mountain Care Board. So we're the one that's getting good. So why is it, yeah, I, I, I have a question as to why we're, why we the state are not fully responsible for the cost rather than having those costs pushed back to carriers, hospitals, et cetera, through the bill back form. It might help to look at the language of the, for me, that's an unresolved issue. I'm, I'm, I'm not yet comfortable with the idea that bill back is actually uh, put in, uh, is, is, is in play here. You could also be prescriptive and you could right. say something that, you know, well, the I, board I, shall not use bill back. Well, I understand what the consequences of all this are. The consequences yeah. are that it, it creates a much uh, heavier, a bigger lift for us in the legislature in terms of the appropriations impact. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I think I feel some responsibility to understand whether or not build back yeah. is the appropriate mechanism for yeah. something which we're setting in motion rather than up. And, that, and we'll look at that left. They right. addressed that because I asked them, I pushed them, I said, well, how much of this is build back? How much of this is federal? How much is this? And their lawyers came back and this was their, but we can. And, and just to clarify again for folks and for myself, I can look. We often say, well, this is a state portion, and the reason that it's a state portion versus some other entity is that there's a Medicaid match. That is not what we're, that there's no Medicaid match in play here. It's, yeah. it's the bill back formula in terms of state versus other yeah. dollars. Yeah. Okay. The other thing I like here is I said the fiscal note does not address any potential costs, offsets, savings, et cetera, in out years sure. should the state move forward. I just wanted to address that because there's always a argument of, or discussion about does it cost more or does it save money and right. I do not address that. Right. Okay, so can you just scroll back to the first page and just let me look at the let us look at the bottom line numbers. And so with with the bill back as reviewed by the or analyzed by the Green Mountain Care Board, we're looking at in terms of appropriations that are being required the state totals only for FY19, which is where we are in the budget, we'd be looking at uh, somewhere between 170000 and 206000 If, in fact, for some whatever reason, the bill back was not seen as an appropriate mechanism for this, the dollars are in the gross total. Oh, is that correct? Correct. 425 to 515. So it really becomes closer to half a million dollars. 425 to half a million. Okay. Question. Yeah, go ahead. further. We didn't let you get to the end of your memo, no one, but you later in the memo, okay, reference um, 1115 waivers and how um, the last paragraph, yeah, and how the ACO might fund. Oh, forgive me, I do. <laughs> so let me go through that. <laughs> well, that was part of the Senate. Um, Oh, okay, yeah, 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 that gets into how the Senate Health and Welfare was looking at pension funding. So, yeah, that's a different issue. Okay, so so that doesn't apply to the bill as passed by Senate Appropriates, the Senate. Yes. That applies to the bill that came out of Senate Health and Welfare. Health and, Welfare. and only because of one of the financing mechanisms they were thinking about using, which okay. was the DSR payments. Great, and thank you. Okay. I guess might have to move into Senate Health. Well, do you have any more questions on this version? I'll let Chairman Lippert. Are there other questions from committee members on the? So what we just looked at is as past the Senate. Yeah. Okay. So and because you, of the discussions and people asking about it, um, sometimes I have a habit of putting historical. Other times I don't because I think it's just too many words. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I. Well, we 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 as a committee have said we want to look yes, at both, so. which is why I added it. So, um, so as past Senate Health and Welfare, um, this. 
bill was different. It required the Green Mountain Care Board to convene, facilitate, and supervise a working group. Uh, it would have allowed the Senate Health and Welfare Committee, not you, um, just a joke, <laughs> to meet up to uh, five times um, following the 2018 adjournment to provide guidance, receive updates, and initially the bill was passed, just looked at the legislative per diems, and this assumed that all five members would attend all five meetings, and this is what the legislative per diems, about $5,500 for the per diems. Um, then the board, um, what's today, so two days ago, one day ago, provided us with an update on, because uh, based on the requests and the discussions around Senate Health, where they provided an additional estimate. Um, and they say that for them to do this, it ranged from seven hundred and forty to eight hundred and thirty thousand um, dollars. Again, if you were to apply bill back, it would be between two ninety, well, three hundred thousand, between three hundred and three hundred and thirty thousand, roughly. It's not on their let, not on their thing. I wrote it in, um, and I can, I can jump to their thing real quick if you like or not. But basically, of that, it's all one year. It's not over two years. Um, why don't I just pull up their thing really quick? Sure, and then you're saying it's all, yeah, why don't you? And then I'll come back to mine and I can get to uh, Representative Brickland's. Uh, Lauren, this is the wrong one. I need the other one. This one's from 4 2. Okay, watch the. You, this is what I, I posted the one I just got from Susan. Oh, so there's Susan. So you have Green Mountain Care Board and you have Susan. I think. So we might want to combine them. I thought I... Sorry. No, you're good. Maybe maybe combine them so it's not so... Or put them all under the Green Mountain Care Board. I don't know. Okay. But maybe later so we don't... Yep. Thank you. Um, so the estimate here, you can see under... So it's all one year. It's not a two-year. It's a one-year. And so there's 650000 for contracts. And then again, the 90 to 180 for, uh, an F, for an additional FTE. And that's where their combination is. So they're, let's see, convene a working group, service and benefits, development. So they're saying 250000 for that piece. And then I actually would let them speak to this 400000 I don't quite understand it um, based on how it's written here. But essentially, the, their review of the Senate Health and Welfare Bill, looking at, I'm assuming at their time, this is what their estimate is. Um, again, I'll let them speak to it. Um, so to get to Representative Brickland's question, part of the bill stated that to the extent permitted under the all-payer ACO agreement and under Vermont's our Medicaid waiver, our global commitment, up to 300000 in expenses incurred by the ACO to develop a draft operation model described in the committee version shall could be funded through delivery reform payments. So this is that piece with the delivery system reform payments. If you recall, in the DIVA budget, there's $2.6 million going to uh, one care for this delivery system reform payments. And it's it's basically money to help them get their systems, their IT systems, up and running to be able to measure and do all the pieces. And it's going out to the providers and to sort of help them move on this area. And there was a sense that they could take some of that money and instead of using it for the DSR payments, one care could use that in sort of helping with the under uh, of this piece. What became um, was a lot. A lot of information has come to light since then. One of which is that my two questions or issues to sort of flag on that are, one is that those $2.6 million are HIT funds. So, um, and it's not, uh, it's coming out of the HIT fund. So my, and they are a mix of 90-10 and 60-40. Uh, the second piece is that under the global commitment waiver, the recent uh, agreement is that it was specific saying, yes, you can use this money for these kind of things, delivery system reform payments. If we were to take that 300000 out and use it for this, it's not necessarily clear that we can actually get a federal match on that anymore. So you're taking away $300,000, but that may, it would be 300000 gross, and so you're going to 2.6, it just, it, 
you may not be able to match that money. So you're pulling out 300,000 gross. So the question is whether that was 90, 10, or whether it was 60, 60 40 as well. Exactly. So but the 2.6 is the grossed up amount. So if you take out 300,000, the 2.6 might not be 2.3, it might be something less. So, and that was all stuff that came to light afterwards. So I, I think that if the committee were interested in doing that piece, further exploration would be required. I don't know that this committee wants to use this money from that piece based on what you've already recommended to. So anyway, that's what that piece is about. Um, Then it also creates the universal primary care fund in the treasury, but again, did not raise any specific revenues for this. Right. So that's the um, yeah. Well, I think I uh, appreciate your walking us through that. I think it. I have to say honestly, for me at least, see you with questions as to whether whether we have a sufficient analysis, fiscal analysis of what we have in front of us, but in either version. Uh, but it gives us a general sense of what what the Green Mountain Care Board is anticipating as they're being assigned to work in the Senate passed version and give us a better understanding, although there's I think I think the issue around the uh, eleven fifteen waiver money is one that really does need to be understood because it sounds like it could have some significant impact. Tim? Um, I want to play some of this back to you, Nolan, just to see if I've got it. Because um, the things I'm interested in here are comparing, um, you know, depending on what this committee and what the House may or may not ultimately do, but comparing what the costs of these two proposals are, um, because they're going to be very interested <laughs> across the hall, I suspect. Um, what the Senate passed uh, was a bill that they are presumably going to put in their appropriate in their budget that's going to come out next week. Um, they passed legislation that will have a final cost to the state, assuming that bill back mechanism is available, of somewhere in the two hundred thirty-six thousand, three hundred eight thousand dollar range. That. In this year's budget, the Senate is going to put in their budget somewhere in the hundred and seventy to two hundred and six thousand dollars. Assuming that they say, yeah, the Green Mountain Care Board's estimates estimate. are reasonable. Okay, I, I get it. So they can put anything they want, but this is an estimate that, that suggests. Right. Okay. Um, what Senate Health and Welfare passed, in contrast was something that the Green Mountain Care Board estimates. And by the way, I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you yeah. off, but the Green Mountain Care Board hadn't put out the, yeah. this estimate when it passed the Senate. Yeah. So there was no number when it passed the Senate, which is why it's sort of... Right. So but the Senate chose to do it that way. Well, yeah, but they didn't know what the estimate was, and well, so now they're... That's what they were choosing to not correct. know at that time what yes. the estimate was when they passed it. Right. So, so, so that estimate is... Um, that it would cost, the Senate Health and Welfare Bill would require somewhere in the neighborhood of seven hundred forty to $830,000. Um, 300 of that potentially could be pulled out of already appropriated in the House budget, $300,000 that um, was linked into um, $2.6 million for the ACO, which was um, uh, a technology funding under Yeah, delivery. mostly implementation and delivery, so delivery service reform. Okay, so, so potentially 300000 of that um, might already be accounted for, but we'd be taking it away from uh, something that's already in the House budget. Well, I think what it was is they had heard from Todd Moore and I think it was more of you can use of the 2.6 we give to one care. One care can take 300 of it and use it for this purpose instead. So we weren't pulling it out and giving it to the board. We were just saying, okay, you may use up to 300,000 of this 2.6 one care right. to work on this with us. That's okay. my interpretation of that. Well, I guess what I was trying to get to is money that hasn't been accounted for in the budget yet, and 
the Senate Health and Welfare proposal is the 740 to 830 less $300,000. No, which is already in the budget. It's 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 well, it's 740 to 830 or 300 to 332 if you assume bill back, right? Because that's the gross. And then and then the 300,000 is just already appropriated and then just saying you may use this for this instead, which again I feel needs further exploration of whether they want it. If you were to move forward with that, I would recommend that we revisit that piece okay. and understand it better. Then let me be clear with my question. What I'm trying to get to is how much would, if we, for example, out of this committee, um, recommended moving forward with a health uh, and welfare type bill, mm -hmm. um, what would we be asking appropriations to appropriate for FY19 relative to the numbers we see here if we you know, are able to pass the Senate approved version of this bill? Uh, it looks like we're asking the Appropriations Committee to appropriate about $200,000. Yeah. So what's the health and health and welfare um, equivalent? I think the health and welfare equivalent would be the 740 to 830 or the, the 300 to 332 if you were to, I guess that's assuming bill back. The 740 to 830 is gross. If you assume that it's bill backable, yeah. then it's 300 to 332. And that gets in that conversation of whether you think bill back's appropriate, plus the per diem. And then the separate, separate question is whether you t allow one care to use that 300000 that we're giving them for other purposes. We're not, that that's, to me, requires further research. But we're not taking it and putting it back in, per se, or, you know what I mean? Yeah. So can I just say that? So I think along the lines of what he's asking in terms of questions, I found myself thinking earlier, could you do like essentially a side-by-side? -side? Yeah. Uh, uh, the Senate has passed, the Senate has yeah. uh, passed Senate Health and Welfare so that we're looking at numbers and you know, whether applied bill back supply or not applied the gross dollars, et cetera, so that we have a side-by-side -side fiscal comparison. I think that's what we, so that we're not trying to. Sure. And appropriated sure. funds versus new funding. Because some of it was already in the budget in one of those, correct? Well, I don't think there's anything that's appropriate. Because appropriate. Yeah. Appropriate. there's nothing in the House nothing. budget. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, there's nothing in the House budget because we didn't have we didn't have this proposal and the budget went to the Senate. So uh, let me ask a separate question. I'm not skipping over here, Marie. Um, do you, as the someone from the Joint Fiscal Office, can you share with us or do you know what the Senate has put into their version of the budget with regard to S-53? I don't know yet. Um, the last sheet I had seen was sort of what their thinking was, and then they had um, a tracking sheet which had placeholders of different things that the Senate had passed, and then for the committee to sort of visit about whether they include that in the budget or not, I have not seen. So can you, can you tell us at what point we will know at what, at what point will we know what the Senate's actually doing in terms of proposing in their budget to address S-53? I'd like to know that in terms of the time frame for us to resolve what we're doing with regard to S-53 yeah. and whether or not we will have that information or can have that information prior to, we, to us making a decision. Because what we decide in this committee has a direct impact yeah. on our appropriations process. We understand, regardless, that because of the because the constitutional requirement that the budget starts in the house and we didn't have the budget or they didn't have the budget there's there's this disjointedness but to the degree that we as a committee can know what the senate's intentions are yeah. it might help inform to some degree what we choose to do yeah and i can check in with them because they're they've been taking testimony all week on their budget no i realize there's many other moving parts whether it's I mean, whether it's their intent, I'll ask about their intentions because whether it's in the bill or not, nothing's in the bill per se until it's all in the bill, I guess. So I will check in with Stephanie and the chair of Senate Appropriations to get a sense of what their thinking is on this. Okay. And I'll report back to you. Okay. Good. And, and Amber? I have a question for the 300000 on the health and welfare version. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it goes from 740 to 840. But if you apply bill back, that drops to 300 to 3, 
thirty. Yeah, it's like two ninety six yeah. to three thirty two. Yeah. So. But the um, the delivery system reform payments that go to one care cannot be used to counteract that three hundred thousand. It could only be used for one care's portion of working through the system. Well, let me refer to that. You can use it for however you want. You're the legislature, so you can say we want to pull three hundred thousand out and put it here. But the thing that I flag is one is that it's coming out of HIT funds, mm -hmm. which yeah. you know you can do whatever you want with it. But again, again, those are monies that we've appropriated specifically for HIT stuff. Um, and then two, there are implications of pulling it out and giving it to the Green Mountain Care Board. So if you look at my footnote at the bottom, number two, the governor's budget includes 2.6 million, 941,000 of it is state for delivery system reform payments. If that 300,000 is not matchable. And you were to pull it out, then you were only given six hundred and forty-one thousand, and then that grosses up to less than two point six, because it's you're taking it away from the base that could be grossed up. If it is matchable, then you're only taking then you're the, then then the board or then the uh, delivery system reform still has like two point two or two point three depending on different matching rates. That's why I say you have, we have to better understand, you know, can this money I don't believe it was completely vetted. It, it, needed, it, it needs further vetting, and I'm concerned that it, that money uh, would not be able. I'm concerned about our ability to use global commitment funds specific for that, because that might be falling under more of an MCO investment kind of thing, of which we are uh, pulling back on because of our agreement with the federal government on that. One, yeah. one little, just to go into the weeds a little bit further. Yeah. Um, theoretically. If you do look at primary care, mm -hmm. there would be a technology component, and digital technology people could be part of the stakeholders in this group, which theoretically, if you want to play with numbers, you could probably get the 90-10 match, theoretically. The 90-10, I think, is no. for specific pieces. And so even of that 2.6, some of it's 90-10, some of it's 60-40 mm -hmm. or whatever, it all depends on what bucket it's, what specific task. Okay. Like in that 2.6, there's a whole list of different tasks of how that money is being spent. And so it has to meet certain criteria. I don't know that this would, because this is really for, you know, and the question is whether it's matchable. We'd have to have further. So I, I, if you were to do that, I might not. Well, you can decide how you want it, but pulling it, using the DSR money might be problematic. Yeah. Any other questions for Norman at this point?